was up last night reading a load of stuff, watching different videos and stuff, so I slept in for the Andrew Marshall, but I managed to find it on the BBC's own website, and it just so happens that he's interviewing um, a woman who was born and brought up in the housing schemes of Irvine, which is half an hour, 40 minutes away from where I was born in Greenock. And so she has a very deep understanding of the problems which face the working classes in uh, not only Irvine, but all throughout Scotland. Scotland is basically majorly a, a working class um, country, um, steeped in socialism and socialist values. And um, I trust this woman before I trust any of the Billington boys. Um, or Nigel Farage, whose f father was a stockbroker, he was a stockbroker. Um, UKIP were put in place um, as controlled opposition and to steal working class votes from Labour to ensure the Tories won the next election. Um, well, this uh, the past election. And he did vote, which I didn't, <laughs> because I live in England. I live in the Tory heartlands of England, to be honest. I hear people on here who really should know better with their disguise, barely disguised um, support for UKIP and Nigel Farage, um, calling the SNP Nazis. Um, the SNP are certainly not Nazis. Um, they're not even ethnic nationalists. They are civic nationalists, which is completely different, which... Um, is a form of nationalism which looks after the people who um, live in the country, not only the ones who were born there. Basically, it's looking out for the community, yeah, um, small communities. Um, and it's all about um, decentralisation of power away from the city of corruption, the city of London. So, Right, let's watch Nicola Sturgeon and see what she's got to say. It's a significant uh, and very serious situation. <clears throat> I think it's time for a fundamental look at the headline rate of tax that companies pay. But I also think there's uh, work that the Scottish Government and the UK Government can do together to support the local infrastructure in Aberdeen. The oil and gas sector in the North Sea does have a strong future if we do the right things now, but we've got to make sure that the infrastructure of Aberdeen is right to support that sector, but also to support over the uh, next few years diversification as well. At the time of the referendum, the Scottish Government was predicting a 7.9, up to 7.9 billion revenue coming in from, from North Sea oil and gas to the Scottish Government. That's now a thirteenth of that is likely. So it's a huge, huge hole in the revenues. How does that change well, your thinking? Firstly, let me say that the projections the Scottish Government made were in line with all external projections yeah, for, for price and, not, and for revenues. I remember David Cameron coming in the, the final few months of the referendum campaign and saying to people here, vote no for a £200 billion oil bonanza. Uh, but, you know, even given the difficulties facing oil and gas right now, we've got to uh, remember, and I, I can point to, the real strengths of the Scottish economy, notwithstanding the difficulties we're seeing in the North Sea. We've got higher employment in Scotland uh, than other parts of the UK uh, right now. Taking, lower, lower growth, taking, well, we've had three years of continuous economic growth. That's the longest continuous period in the lifetime of the Scottish Parliament. Employment levels now are record levels and higher than their pre-recession peak. But if you do £7 billion pounds of revenue annually into the Scottish Exchequer, that has to be made up somehow. And I just wonder how it's going to be made well, up. I've, I've said our, our growth in onshore revenues over the next few years is, is projected to significantly outstrip the decline in offshore revenues. And our deficit, even on the most pessimistic projections, it will fall every year over uh, the, the remainder of this decade. So, you know, the point here, and it's a point that is often lost uh, about the, the, the case for independence, and you know, I take some responsibility for perhaps not getting this argument across strongly enough during the referendum campaign, is that the case for Scotland as a, an independent, strong, independent country was never based on oil. Nonetheless, you were talking about what Cameron said. You yourself talked about a second oil boom, which hasn't exactly happened, has it? Well, what I'm saying is, you know, our projections were not out of line with external projections. Let's hear more about what the UK government uh, that wanted so much to keep the levers that affect the North Sea in their hands. Let's hear what they're going to, to do. And I hope that in the next few days we hear some positive news about support for the North Sea and some positive news about a city deal for Aberdeen. Speaking of David Cameron, you've also been negotiating him, with him about the, the Scotland bill and greater powers mm. for, for Scotland under the, under the uh, UK. How's that going? 
the new powers in the, the new Scotland bill don't go anywhere near as far as I would like. I don't think they go as far as was promised during the referendum campaign, but there are powers I would rather have than not have. But in parallel to that, we are negotiating what's known as the fiscal framework that, that goes around that How much money you've got, to really? take account of the new tax and spending powers. Now, these ne negotiations are ongoing. If we're going to get these new powers agreed and in place before the Scottish Parliament election, the negotiations got to conclude by the middle of February. So time is now, short. time is short, uh, the clock is ticking, and there is a long distance still to travel. The Scottish Government will be busting a gut to try to get to a deal, but we will need to see more movement, significantly more movement from the UK Government than we've seen so far. Um, and if we don't get that, I will not sign up to something that is unfair to Scotland. I'm not asking for any special favours for Scotland or for any special treatment. I'm simply uh, asking for fairness and I won't agree to something that doesn't deliver that. And uh, David Cameron should be under no illusions about that. Now, another big political event we expect this year could be the EU referendum. Now, if the country votes to leave the EU, we get Brexit, as it's called, would that definitely trigger a further Scottish independence referendum? If Scotland had voted to stay in and the UK as a whole votes to come out, which therefore means Scotland faces being taken out of the EU when we don't want to be, I've said before and I will say again, I think it is highly likely that would trigger an overwhelming demand for a second Scottish referendum on independence. Uh, you know, the democratic outrage of being taken out of Europe against our will, I think, would make that almost inevitable. If we actually do vote to leave the EU, there'll be lots and lots of questions about what happens next and lots of stuff to be sorted out, negotiations and so forth. In that same period, we could have a referendum on Scotland leaving the UK. That would be general political meltdown in terms of our traditional institutions. I don't want that situation to arise. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not taking some kind of Machiavellian view of this, that somehow uh, I want to engineer that scenario because it might lead to a second independence referendum. I'll be arguing uh, for Scotland to vote to stay in the, e in the EU, and I'll be arguing if people in the rest of the UK care to listen. I don't know whether they will or not, but if they do, I'll be arguing that the UK as a whole should vote to stay in the EU. Now, it's suggested, we don't know yet, that David Cameron wants to hold the referendum on Europe on June the 23rd. Would that be a problem for the SNP? I think it would be a mistake for David Cameron. I had the Foreign Secretary in here last week and said as much to him directly. Uh, two reasons why I would uh, not be in favour of a June referendum. One, you might interpret as being you know, a bit selfish. The Scottish election is in May. Indeed, the Welsh, the Northern Irish, the London elections in May. I, I think to have... A referendum campaign starting in parallel would be disrespectful to those important elections. You've still got seven weeks of, um, yeah, after those main but, elections. But you would, given the, the statutory campaign period for the European referendum, you would undoubtedly start to confuse those issues. Uh, but the second reason is I, I think it would be better for David Cameron to leave more time between, uh, if he does get a deal at the February European Council, to leave more time between that deal and the point of decision. Because one of the big problems I see for the in campaign at the moment is that it, as far as David Cameron is concerned, it's very much focused on these narrow issues of renegotiation, when in actual fact, if the in campaign is going to prevail, this is going to have to become a positive in principle campaign about why it's better for the UK to stay within the European Union. It's going to have to become a yes campaign. Uh, well, I tell you, you know, while there are differences between the Scottish campaign and, and a European referendum, there are undoubtedly analogies. And if the in campaign behaves the way the no campaign behaved in the Scottish referendum, I fear it will lose because, you know, in the Scottish referendum, the two campaigns started miles apart in the polls. We had a thoroughly negative and... What you call you know, project fear. We had time. a negative fear-laden campaign from the no campaign and they almost lost. In the referendum uh, for, for Europe, the EU referendum, the two campaigns are much closer to start with. And if the in campaign falls into the trap of the no campaign, uh, I fear it will lose. And many people looking at the electoral system across the UK think it's almost impossible, not impossible, but almost impossible for Labour to win the next election with a majority at Westminster. One way through that might be some grand alliance with the SNP. If the Labour Party came to and said, look, we have genuinely <sighs> gone through a change of heart, a change of soul, and we are genuinely in favour of full-scale Scottish home rule. Is there any kind of negotiation, conversation you could have with them on that basis? If we go back to before the general election last year, it was the SNP that was saying we wanted to be part of a progressive alliance. It was Ed Miliband who completely turned his back on that, and I actually think Ed Miliband would have done better if he'd handled that.
that issue differently. I think if there was a change the, of well, heart, is my question. Look, I don't think Labour as a government right now is a credible motion in any sense. But that's not for me to sort out that. I'm afraid it's for Labour to try to find a way of sorting out. But they agree with you. You agree with them and they agree with you on lots of issues, Absolutely. including austerity and taxation and so forth and fairness and all of those agendas. Not perhaps Trident. I wonder what you made of, of Jeremy Corbyn's suggestion that you could keep the Trident submarines and therefore keep the jobs in Scotland but not have nuclear missiles on I, I think it was ridiculous and, you know, I think it's a sign of just how tortured these debates are becoming within the Labour Party. Now, on Trident, I agree with Jeremy Corbyn. I, I, I'm not in favour of the renewal of Trident. Um, and we might have a vote on that in the House of Commons sooner rather than later. And I think the real challenge to Jeremy Corbyn is can he get his party into the position he wants them to be in so that we can have a, a, any chance at all of stopping the renewal of Trident. For Labour to sit on the fence on this issue or have a free vote on this issue will leave them without a shred of credibility. So uh, on this issue, uh, I hope Jeremy Corbyn can stamp his authority on his party and do so quickly. All right, there's lots of Scottish issues we could talk about. We won't run through all of them, but one of the things that caused a lot of controversy was the closure of the fourth road bridge for so long. There was a budget originally for rolling maintenance and repairs on the fourth road bridge, and it was taken away and moved to other departments. It was taken away. No, that was a bad mistake, wasn't it? No, no, hold on. All of the essential maintenance that was required to be done on the fourth bridge uh, was done, um, and the, the, the disrepair, the... the uh, the, the problem with the fourth bridge, and there is a Scottish parliamentary inquiry into this just now, which is ongoing, so we'll see what it has to say, but the problem that occurred in the, the fourth road bridge was something that was unforeseen and unforeseeable. There are engineers around who say that it wasn't unforeseen foreseeable, and it wasn't unforeseen, and that there were cracks, and there was a budget to deal with them, but that budget was removed. There's, there, there, is, you know, the, there is nothing that was proposed to be done to the fourth road bridge uh, that, that wasn't done because of budgetary issues that resulted in what uh, caused the problem before. Christmas, but the key thing, and the key thing of importance uh, to tra the travelling public, is that that bridge was fixed thanks to engineers who performed heroics uh, over the, the pre-Christmas period, sometimes in very difficult weather conditions. That bridge was opened ahead of schedule, and as we speak right now, cars are trundling across it in both directions, and hopefully HGVs will be before too long as well. Now, something that has entertained the entire country greatly has been the passage of arms between Alex Salmond and Donald Trump. Do you think Donald Trump should be banned from Scotland? Uh, well, that's not my uh, decision, <laughs> perhaps, perhaps thankfully. You know, I, uh, as First Minister, took the decision uh, to take away the status that Jack McConnell, one of my predecessors, had given him uh, as a global Scot, one of the people we asked to uh, promote Scotland overseas. You know, it's not, uh, it's not politic for uh, the head of a, a government in one country to pass comment on a upcoming election of... in another country. Let's just say I, I have every confidence that the good sense of the American people will prevail on the question of Donald Trump. Finally, I'm going to be talking to Rona Fairhead, the chair of the BBC Trust on this programme. Um, I know that the SNP has views about what kind of broadcasting environment you want and how you want the BBC to act in future. What's your message to her? I think the BBC have got to reflect on the fact that if you look at the most recent audience council figures, you know, something like 60 to 65 percent of people outside of Scotland thought that the BBC news and current affairs broadly reflected their life. In Scotland, that figure was less than 50 percent. Yeah put forward, the Scottish Government has put forward proposals that would see the BBC have a more federal structure with more programming in Scotland, uh, more platforms in Scotland. And you've suggested, of channels. I think you'd like a, a specific Scottish channel. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, BBC, many people in BBC Scotland would agree with that as well. So these are proposals we put forward constructively as part of the Charter Renewal uh, debate. And I hope that uh, the BBC uh, and the BBC Trust will listen to those proposals carefully. Um, I think the BBC uh, is an institution we should protect and that we should uh, support. Uh, but I also think people in Scotland have got a right, as people across the UK do, to see the BBC reflect uh, life in Scotland here perhaps better than it has done sometimes in the past. Nicholas Sturgeon, First Minister, thanks very much. Well, we have it. Um, give us a thumbs up and a thumbs down. Comment and a share. Thanks for watching.